Old Path in our study through the Old Testament. We are currently in the book of Esther, and uh, we're going to take on chapters 2 and 3 today. And um, before we get there, I, I made uh, the first one of these studies, just the first chapter was uh, very much brief compared to what we usually do. And uh, re the reason really kind of behind that was um, chapters 2 and 3 really is where it kind of takes a, a real turn because Esther is going to be brought into the narrative. Uh, what we had in chapter one really is kind of only the setup for it. Um, and a little bit of the background of it, of course, this is uh, at a time during the captivity that the uh, the Jews had from the time of Babylon, and now it is into the time of the Persians. Uh, Esther's time of writing predates that of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. They came in under the next king after that. Um, so this is now Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, is who he's mentioned as. And uh, Artaxerxes is the uh, the king that was in place in Persia during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So there's some really intriguing things that we find in the second and third chapter that we'll get into. But what we find is that from the removal of Vashti as the uh, as the, the queen, now there's this opening. Now, of course, God knows the things that are coming down the road. And uh, we're going to be introduced to some other characters in this and uh, Haman right at the top of that. And so as a, uh, as a reminder um, that this man should not have even existed, and we're going to get to that point here in just a moment. But this is another one of those occasions where you find that there is such a hatred of the Jews historically among a group of people. Now, Haman, as we're going to find out, is an Amalekite. And uh, the hatred that the Amalekites had for the Jews goes back centuries and really goes all the way back to the Exodus and where God had a particular problem with them. Um, and uh, that's mentioned. We'll get into that when we get there. But the idea that Haman is even there at this place and at that time really kind of shows how things were not done as they should have been. And I'll give you some uh, the references for that when we get to it. But suffice for where we are right now. We know that the, the time of their captivity, uh, from the time that they fell to the hands of the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar, that their, their time in that captivity was only going to be 70 years. And then at the beginning of the return under Zerubbabel, then Ezra and Nehemiah, the rollout was 100 years even at that point, from when they should have gone back till things got to kind of their place of completion, just round numbers. Esther's time predates that uh, of the going back of Ezra and Nehemiah. So we'll get a little bit of timeline information. It's really not horribly important that we know, though bits and pieces are given, and it's more for the Jewish audience of when did these things take place. But what we have in this, and, and I mentioned it in week one, that there is um, no mention of God in this, but you will definitely see, especially as we go into next week, um, and when we get to chapter four, there are things that are simply there by implication. And it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to see that God's hand is in all of this. So what we'll do is we'll get to chapter two. And uh, having turned there, let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll take a look at the text. Father, we thank you as we can come to your word that you can open our understanding and our, our minds and um, that by your spirit, you can make, a, make it known to us why these things matter. And then we can see that your hand has been upon your people all through the ages. And the promises made to Abraham uh, would, would be preserved, even in the times when your people would rebel against you, yet you sustain them because you had bigger things going on as history would record for us. So we give you thanks that we can study these books. They're important in not only the history of Israel, but how we can see how you interact with your people through the ages. So may we be attentive to what we read. And we give to you all thanks and all praise in Jesus' name. Okay, okay. <laughs> so in chapter uh, 2, it begins this way by saying, After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, uh, that he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. So what appears to be the the opening part of this is, is this might uh, express some level of regret that now things have calmed down a little bit. 
But he had signed a decree to make sure that she could never come back into the place of being queen. And so she has now been removed from any of that just simply because she did not want to be an object of the entertainment that seemed to be uh, what the king was looking to do. He's going to show off his wife to everyone who was watching. And she didn't want any of it. Chapter one is all about that. And so he asks his advisors what should be done. And they say, make a decree that it cannot be altered. It's the, what they call the, the law of the Medes and the Persians, meaning that once a decree like this is put out, then there's no going back. Well, at this point, Ahasuerus, uh, Xerxes, sees that what he has done, maybe he has regret to this, and that's what it seems to be, because it's very, very quickly on that his his uh, same people that had been advising him say, well, here's an idea, let's, let's try this. So what we have here in, in chapter uh, 2, verse 2, says, so the king's uh, servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and then let the king appoint officers in all of the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all of the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters, under the custody of Haggai, the uh, king's eunuch, custody of the women, and let beautiful preparations be given to them, and then let the young woman who pleases the king, let the young woman, rather, who pleases the king, be queen instead of Vashti, and this thing pleased the king, and so he did. Now, there already seems to be, as we see here, because of the people who are in these positions, there are already uh, concubines and there are already women available to uh, to King Ahasuerus here. Now, again, this is this is just at a time it's almost unimaginable to us, but we know that this was kind of one of those things in, in that part of the world through those centuries that the idea that kings, because of how powerful they are, would have wives given to them, they would have concubines and all the rest. And so the, the, the sickening part of this is, is the, the kind of objectifying that would happen to these women. Actually, once this all took place, who these women were, their lives were pretty much as, as the idea of having any kind of freedom was pretty much over. And so the, this decree goes out, let's find somebody to take Vashti's place. So the way that they do it is just cast this broad net. Let's find anybody who is pleasing to the eyes, if you will, and let's bring them in and then he could take his pick. So they were going to go through a great deal of time of, of looking at them and making sure that they were presentable. There's perfuming that would go on and they're doing all kinds of beautification to these women, not just over a day's course of time. We're going to see here it's, it's a year-long process. So the idea that all of this would be done for the king, again, it's just kind of it's disgusting when you see it. But again, this is that part of the world at that time. Doesn't make it right, obviously, but this is just how it was. So remember that by this time, not just the Jews, but the fact that Haman is there as an Amalekite, it just shows you that this is really kind of the world power at the time. And the conquest of the nations brings their people into the nation itself. And so it's a mixture of all kinds of cultures. And remember at chapter one, it was clear that that was the case because throughout all the provinces and all of the lands, the husbands were given this broad power to rule their, their houses, even to the point where whatever their native language was, that had to be the language of the house. So you can see that there were a number of cultures and nations and everything that were just a part of this. So in this case, put the word out, we're going to find somebody for the, to take Vashti's place, and they're going to bring in these innumerable amounts of young women. And when it says virgins, it can mean both things. Women that are of marrying age that are not married to someone else, and they have their virginity intact as well. That could be a, a, the same thing. They could be one and the same. And again, depends on who you ask. There's not really unanimity in this. Uh, clearly, these are, these are women of marrying age and that they were available for marriage. And uh, whether their virginity was intact, again, it's debated. But it doesn't really change the narrative here. So... At verse 5, we say now in we see that in Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. So this goes all the way back. He's of the line that gave us Saul. <clears throat> so King Saul, he's of that line. And it says, 
that same one that the uh, this would be Mordecai and perhaps the father that was uh, carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah. Clearly, this isn't speaking of Kish because Kish was long before that, the carrying away. Remember, Saul was the very first king. And there wasn't a carrying away of the kings to, to uh, Babylon until the end of the reign of the kings. So a son of Kish, Saul, or any of the rest of them, they would have been at the very beginning of the history of the kings. So this would have been down through the lines of descendants, Mordecai, perhaps even his father, uh, carried away captive. They were uh, captured with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And so Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Now, clearly, we can see where this is already going. Most of us probably have read this or heard sermons on it or whatever. So we can see clearly that that uh, Esther is going to be one of those people that are seen as being of that age and of beauty and everything that is necessary to fit the, the requirements. But the king was going to be able to take his time with this whole thing. So Mordecai is introduced into this. Esther is now introduced into this. What we get are the intrigues that get her to the point where she will become the queen. And then ultimately the problems that really what you find develop between Mordecai and also with Haman. And so, uh, interestingly enough, there is so much that we have here in front of us, things that really even uh, occur until this day. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. You probably know where I'm going with this, but a holiday that is celebrated by Jews to this day, based upon this, this book. So verse 8, So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that, uh, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace in the care of Haggai, the custodian of uh, the women. So you can see that there is already ongoing this idea that there are other women available to Ahasuerus. And so again, this would be the case. Kings would be like this, where either because of political pacts that they may have, um, men would be, or uh, other kings or people from other places would be giving their daughters as a way of, of procuring uh, some kind of political treaty or some kind of political work between the nations, between the kingdoms. And in this case, he's above all of those. Ahasuerus is the king, pretty much controls that part of the world. But in order to try to keep peace or pacts that he would they, that the other nations would have, they would give their daughters. And so we, we saw this with Solomon. It was the same kind of a situation. So in this case, it's not as though once Vashti was gone, he has no one there. What they're going to do is try to find a replacement for Vashti, but he's going to really swell, if you will, the number or the ranks of these women who would be brought in. They would have a night with him, and then they would be living in his house, whether he would ever see them again or not. They're just part of the concubines. They never went back to their lives again. Again, it's just such a tragic thing that, that uh, it shows... If nothing else, it just shows the wickedness of man, how this could be seen as something that is acceptable when it, it really is such an infringement on what God would have ever wanted. And thank God this whole thing, but for some still backwards places in our world today, this is long since gone. But the idea of either polygamy or the idea of having multiple wives or even concubines, some parts of the world this still goes on, but it is not God's design. So this we know. Anyhow, let's get back to the text. So, in verse 9, the young woman pleased him, and uh, the young woman rather pleased him, and she found favor, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides what was her normal allowance. This is in addition to. So, you can see already Esther is beginning to gain favor with those who were overseeing and making sure that when the time came that she and the other ladies would be prepared to go in and meet the king, she is already at this point finding favor. Now this again, whether it's Joseph in Egypt, wherever it may be, you will find that God at times, for reasons that he knows because of what's coming down the road, uh, puts his people in place and they find favor. And I'll be honest, I to this day, there is still <clears throat> the idea of 
how God prospers his people. And uh, I was just seeing a, a thing today, and we'll, it'll be interesting to see where it comes from or what comes of it. But there is now being spoken of in Israel. Uh, I heard about it just this morning that there are researchers in Israel who say we have found a cure for, for diabetes by making uh, basically what is through stem cells a new pancreas that will work properly. Now, I didn't get a chance to hear much more of it, but I can't wait to read more. But the innovations that happen and how God prospers his people, even now, though many of them don't look to him, yet still he has his hands on his people, preserving them and doing amazing things. They just have favor in his eyes. And I think it's wonderful. So anyhow, you can look that up if you're interested. There's some interesting reading on it. I haven't had a chance to read all the way through it. Anyhow, it says, um, then seven choice maid servants were also provided for her from the king's palace. And he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. And Esther had not revealed her people or her family for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. So again, there's a lot of speculation as to why this is. Why is it that Mordecai didn't want to have it known that she was Jewish? And so the speculation a lot of times wouldn't want that to uh, change whether or not she would, um, you know, be treated differently in this case, or for a, a whole bunch of reasons are proposed. But for whatever reason, Mordecai didn't feel that it was in her best interest to make known to anyone there that she was Jewish. And again, we're going to find that the fact that Mordecai, um, seemingly his defiance is is strictly because he does not want to dishonor God, is that somehow in his calculus? We're just not told. But for whatever reason, keep this to yourself. Don't say where you've come from. You know, um, don't offer that information up. Now, it's going to become an interesting thing because the day will come when she has to be, uh, she has to reveal uh, that that she is Jewish by her, her bloodline. And so we'll get to that in due course. Now, in verse 11, it says, Now every day Mordecai uh, paced in front of the court of the women's quarters, to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young woman's turn came to go to the king, uh, to King Ahasuerus, after she had completed 12 months per, uh, preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of preparation apportioned, six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with perfumes in preparation for beautifying women. Uh, thus prepared, each young woman would... Um, uh, went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. So you, you, this is just setting for us kind of the picture. There was all of this preparation, and it doesn't go into a great deal of, of uh, information. It's just whatever it would be that would beautify the women. You would think skin, things that were perfumes of all of this that would be that when that time came and she could be with the king, that all the preparations possible could be given to her, including whatever she might want to adorn herself with from the women's quarters. So whether that's what she's wearing, whether it's jewelry, whatever it may be, that she may present herself standing above everyone else. And so, again, adornments more than likely is what we're talking about. Try to make yourself look different than everyone else. So all of the women went through, went through the same preparations at this point, we see that already Esther has already become kind of the favorite of the, the head of the eunuchs that would oversee the women at this point anyway. So really interesting that all of this is behind the scenes. Once again, we would believe God is maneuvering things in place because, of course, he has a, a, a greater purpose in this, which will ultimately be the deliverance of the Jewish people in this captivity. That's what this whole book is about, as I'm sure you already know. In verse 14, we get this. So in the evening, she went, uh, and in the morning, she returned to the second house of the women, uh, to the, the custody of uh, Shashgaz, Shash, Shashgaz and uh, the king's unit who kept the concubines. So she went from being among the, the women who were there in that preparation because she goes and she spends a night with the king. Yeah, and now she's not available to go back to her life before. Now she's among the concubines. Again, pretty disgusting that this is the, the way that the world was at the time. They don't have a voice in this. Nobody does. 
It's just what the king wants to do, and this is just the exploitation. It says that she would go then to the king. She would not, rather, go back to the king unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. So, again, we're not told how many this would have been that would have gone there and, and had this be their experience. It could be one night. She's, she's been taken from where she was, spends a whole year in preparation, goes and spends one night with the king and may never see him again. And she'll never have any freedom. She'll just live among the other concubines. But, you know, such is the time. And, and again, shows just how wretched man can be going so far outside of what God would have ever accepted. So in verse 15, now, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of uh, Abihail, the uh, the uncle of Mordecai, that uh, who had taken her as daughter to go to the king, she requested nothing but what uh, Haggai, the king's unit, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So when it came her time, she doesn't do what seemingly what the rest did. She just gets advice. And here's what you should do as you go there. She gets this directly from the person who had, had been showing her such kindness. So Esther was taken to the king Ahasuerus in the royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth in the seventh year of his reign. Now, seventh year is important because of something that's coming up in the next chapter, because it's going to show how long it takes from when she was first made queen until the things that, that uh, Haman is wanting to do. Well, I'll point that out when we get there. So it tells us the king loved Esther more than all of the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all of the other virgins. So he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, we're not told how long all of this process took. We're not told whether there were other ones who came in after her, how long it took from when she first was there until all of this took place. There's not, you know, days, weeks, months, whatever the case may be. We're not told those details. Doesn't matter. By the time it was all said and done, the, the uh, position was given to her as queen. And so we see that the king um, loved her more than the other women. And so he set... The royal crown on her head made her queen instead of Vashti, verse 17. In verse 18, we see this. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all of his officials and his servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of the king. So again, this is kind of the festivities once again have now come back. And uh, nothing like what it was that started the whole thing in chapter one. But then it's there's finally a new queen. She is kind of shown to everyone and everything is like seemingly like it should have been. But we're going to notice that there's just so much that that is even though she has this place of prominence, she's the one above all the rest. He has concubines, probably other wives considered wives, but she is the one who's queen. And so she has that official role that Vashti once had. Again, we don't have a lot of details about this. What we have is this in verse 19. Now, there's something that happens, again, at some time down the road. We don't know how far down the road it was, but this is what we get in verse 19. Then virgins were gathered together a second time. So, seemingly a repeat of what brought Esther in in the first place is now taking place again. We're not told why. It isn't because uh, Esther has been deposed as Vashti was. But now there's a whole new round of that whole same thing going on again. Esther had not by this time revealed her family of her people, just as Mordecai had charged, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. So this just gets thrown out, right out there without any detail. All of a sudden, for whatever reason, whoever had recommended it, we're not told any of that, but what we have now is that Ahasuerus is going to now have a whole second slew of this bring in the, the young ladies and the whole second time he's going to go through this. Now, we're not given any, any reason why. Here's the important part. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Again, we're not told why that is. Nothing is given to us. What we do know is that, that uh, 
for his, fortunately for the, the rest of the story, Mordecai is, is close enough in proximity to them to know that they had become, as it says, furious here. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told it to Queen Esther. And Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. So now one thing that we're told about, that the queen doesn't just go barging in the door. She had to be there. Now, that means that she had to make petition to be there. She didn't just have access. We're going to find that out from some of the later chapters. But somehow, some way, when this information, Mordecai says, there's a plot on his life. And she shares that and says, my uncle, or however she would address him, Mordecai, overheard some guys and they were looking to do harm to you. They want to lay hands on you. This would be something that they're looking to do harm. So she tells the matter in verse 22. So in verse 23, when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed and both were hanged on a gallows and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Interesting that that means that not only were these guys the ones who were the conspirators, but how did it come to him in the first place? Esther told me because it was somebody, a relative of hers, this Mordecai, gives her the information, it gets passed along, and it thwarts what would have been an attempt on his life. Okay, that's just going to that's gonna be sitting there in the archives, and nobody's going to think of it. It's just, it's done. It's finished. No big deal. But there's things coming down the road. So once again, God has his people in place at the time necessary for these things to come to pass, and it's all by design. This is clear from the text as we work through it. At the moment, it may not have seemed like a big deal, but God is maneuvering a lot of things behind the scenes, and no one yet knows the importance of why all this was being done. Now, again, since we've read through it, we already know, but it's intriguing nonetheless. Chapter 3. So after these things, King Ahasuerus prompted Haman, the son of uh, Hamadatha, the Agagite. Now, Agag would have been one of the kings, but he was a king of the Amalekites. Very, very important. Keep that in your mind that Haman is an Amalekite. So think through the times of Saul and David once they came into the land. The, the Amalekites were a problem, but they were a problem all the way back to the time when the, the Jews were coming out of their captivity in Egypt as they were coming up and going towards the promised land, the Amalekites were a problem for them. And through the time, again, of David and Saul and all throughout, they were a problem. They're still around now. I'm going to get to why that's an issue. Now, verse 2. All the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow nor pay homage. So here's an interesting thing. Again, cause for speculation. And it, it seems to be kind of clear as we move through this. Once again, the Mordecai seems to be a man who's devout as a believer um, and, and a Jew who is observant of things that he would know. You don't bow to a man. That would not be something that he would do. Remember, when it's Daniel, same kind of a situation, when he's being expected to bow down and do the things that he's supposed to do, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're not going to, to bow down. They're not going to do the things that, that are being requested of them because they know it would be an offense to God. The idea that Mordecai, a Jew, would bow down to a man, let alone someone who is not, you know, of their, of their ancestry, this is not going to pay any kind of respect to this kind of a man. So Mordecai has nothing to do with it. He won't do any of it. This is going to be the reason why there will be problems until God deals with uh, Haman and the rest of them. But it's a, a very, very important thing that begins to happen here. This will be the crux of the problem. Haman is put into this place of prominence, though he is already, from what we can see, a very, very wealthy man. And we're going to see that because of what he wants to do. So verse 3, When the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? They see everybody else is bowing and paying homage like the king says. What's with you? Why don't you do this? So now it happened, and this was... it. We're not told that there's ever any real dialogue in this. Their whole thing is they're wondering, why is it that you won't do what the king is telling you to do? 
it's an incident. Clearly, everybody knows what's going on. It has to be obvious. If everybody's bowing and there's one guy standing, obviously there's a problem here. So now it happened when they spoke to him daily that he would not listen to them. And they told it. Uh, they told this to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Now that now it's out there in the open. So basically, it's this: the guys are going, "What is with you, Mordecai?" Well, Mordecai's already told him, "I'm a Jew. I won't do this." This is why it seems pretty obvious that he's devout at least enough in this that you don't pay that kind of respect to a mortal man. That is respect that is to give to be given to God alone. So. They say, well, let's see what happens from this. Hey, Haman, by the way, there's this guy, Mordecai, who says that he won't bow because he's a Jew. And they're, they're not going to do that. So they're gonna, they say this to, to Haman and hoping to see what happens. Well, will Haman get him to the point where he has to do it now that it's been told? He's defiant of the king's edict. And Mordecai is this guy who is going to stand on principle because of who he is and where he comes from. He's not going to do this. These guys are saying, let's tell Haman and see if, if he backtracks on this or what comes of it. So again, the challenge is out there. There's the information. So when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath. We're going to read a lot more in the next couple of chapters about how bad this became. In, in fact, Haman is such a petty little man that he's going to say, I can't, you know, I can have all the success in the world, but if Mordecai won't bow to me, I can't get past that. So again, this, the, the pridefulness of man is just such an amazing thing. Because again, the only reason you have that position is because you were put in it, Haman. And some guy's going to basically say, I don't recognize you as anything of that importance, so I'm not going to bow. Well, that's just, it's a bridge too far. Haman will not abide this. That's what ends up happening here. So it says, so when Haman saw this, that was when it all came to be the problem. Verse 6 tells us, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all of the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of, um, of Mordecai. So once again, in, in his thoughts, it's like, okay, I don't want to just take out Mordecai. I hate, not only do I hate him, I hate everything that he's about. So again, you would have to assume, to some extent, Haman, once he hears that he's a Jew, the idea that, that Haman is, is an Amalekite, he has to know where he comes from. He certainly knows where the Jews come from, so it would seem. Then, of course, this is an animus that's been going on for centuries. And so let's just eradicate them all. So again, it's, it's the extermination of an entire group of people is what we're talking about here. And this is before the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, it's like, we can take care of this problem right here. We're going to go out into all the places where you'd find Jews that are under the purview of the Persians, and we can get rid of them all. So again, the, 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 again and again and again, this desire to exterminate the entire group of people we know as the Jews is something that has been going on through the ages. So the, the thought behind this, again, this is demonic. And why would I say that? Well, because if you can eradicate from the, the mind of Satan himself, if you can er eradicate an entire people, you'll break the promise of Messiah at this point. Because again, the promise was that through your line was going to come Messiah, whether it was what was said to David about Solomon and then the forever king, or whether it's just the, what was said to Abraham in the very beginning. So both of those are historical. And so Let's eradicate them right where they are, and that breaks the line. Again, this is the captives of Judah, and it would be through the line of Judah that you would have the Messiah. So the calculus would be get rid of all of the Jews. That would be the, the, perfect, uh, the, the perfect remedy, if you will. But obviously God has other plans. We already know that. So the, this incredible thing, it says in verse 7, In the first month, which was the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus. So five years has gone by from when Queen um, uh, Esther has first come on. So this has taken quite a while. A lot of other things had happened. Um, there's been some campaigns that Ahasuerus has been a part of that history records for us. So a lot of things have taken place. And in, in this place now, it's all going to come to 
um, you know, it, it's now at the crisis point, and that's what's going on here. So, it is in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, that they cast poor, that is, the lot. Now, uh, let's just read the rest of it. Uh, they did this before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. So, what are they casting lots for? Now, again, these are not people that are trying to determine what God wants them to do. This is the consulting of the stars and whatever it is, more than likely, the, 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 they're trying to divine the will of gods or whatever it may be that they're casting these lots. They're trying to find some divine, as they would see it, direction of when should we execute this, this plan. And the plan would be, how are we going to eradicate ourselves uh, or eradicate this problem from among ourselves of the Jews. So when you see it's poor, it's the lots. To this day, to this day, Jews will celebrate every year the feast or the, 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 it's the observance of Purim. And so that's the casting of the lots. And so it's a remembrance of God's deliverance of his people in this captivity based upon these events that we're reading in Esther. So in part of their, their festivities, they will read the entire book of Esther. And they're given uh, noisemakers and, and all kinds of things that they can do. And as they are reading the book, every time that Haman's name is mentioned, all of the noise happens so that it blots out his name. So like if we're reading here, every time that I have said Haman, if this was happening on Purim and I'm among a Jewish audience... Every time Haman's name would be said, they would make so much noise that you couldn't hear his name spoken. It was a way of just saying, he's not even remembered to us. We, you know, his name is being blotted out. It's just, it's so cool. Because it, again, it is their acknowledgement, which is really cool. It is the Jewish people's acknowledgement that God had intervened. For those people who really believe that he did, the, the Jewish people would look at this and say, once again, as he has done so many times in our history, if they are if they are careful to read their history in the Old Testament, they will know that time and again, God has preserved his people when they would have no other reason to be preserved. And the fact that he's brought them into their land now is just, again, testimony to that fact, because there were prophecies saying that God would regather them at some point and they would never be removed again. The last couple of verses of Amos are clear about that. So from 70 AD and the dispersing of them from the land, they had not had the land to themselves until the middle of last century. And I believe God has brought them back into the land for the very last time. So they will never be displaced again. There are just numerous promises that God would regather both Israel in the north and Judah in the south as one nation again. That's never happened historically. It wasn't even a potential until modern times when they were once again established in the land. So modern Israel is nothing more than the miraculous hand of God and the fulfillment of a promise that he had made to those people, that he would give them their land and that they would never be displaced from it when he finally gathers them again. So one of the reasons I just love going to Israel, uh, I'm just reminded everywhere that I look that God is faithful. I don't care how many years it takes, he's always going to be faithful and fulfill to the letter every promise he ever makes. It's good news. So it says that they, they came upon the 12th month. Now they assembled in the first. So what they were going to do to kill all of them, to, to eradicate themselves of the entirety of the Jewish people, it was going to take a full year, but that would give them all of the time as they saw it necessary to make it where when the time comes, all the preparations are made. So it was that they, on the first month that they had done it, they cast lots, it fell on the 12th month. So a lot is going to take place in this year's time. Now, then Haman, Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other people's, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. So here's the case that's being made. We've already got our plans. Let's get the king on board with us. And here's the, the deal. Haman says, I hate them. I want them gone. I want to eradicate them. He goes as far as to lay out his plans, knowing when he wants to implement them. Now he's going to lay this all out before the king. Now it's not to see if the king agrees. It's just to say, you got a problem here. You have subversives. 
They're different than every other group that you've ever conquered. They do not have any respect for you or for your laws. You need to be rid of them. So this is the plan. So they don't keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. That's in verse 8. Verse 9 says, So if it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it to the king's treasuries. So it gives the impression that he's going to give the money to whoever will carry out all the killing here. Uh, instead, what it is, um, they're going to have to do whatever you tell them. I will go ahead and for whatever it would cost, whatever the expense might be to you, king, I will put it to the men who will see that it gets to your treasuries. It's his way of saying, I'll pay you, king, let it go into your treasuries, an enormous sum of money. Depending on what the talent's weight was of silver, and there are different measures of talents, whatever it was, it is an enormous sum of money. And it means that Haman was a man of incredible means at this point. So he does two things that really would want to move Ahasuerus to do this. A, you have subversives, and that's never a good thing in a kingdom. And it's always a reason, probably in and of itself, to make them go away. Secondly, I'll make it for the enrichment of the kingdom, and it'll go directly into the treasuries. So why would Ahasuerus want to do anything different? So he lays it all out there for him and says, this is what we'd like to do. So... The king took his signet ring from his hand, and he gave it to Haman. And uh, he was the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Now, the enemy of the Jews, that starts all the way back at uh, Exodus chapter 17, and that was when they first had their engagement with the Amalekites. For a more detailed uh, kind of a, of a, of a kind of a, a look through this, in fact, we'll go ahead and do it. Let's turn to uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15. And I'm going to show you where, um, because of what they had done in the past and God already knowing what would happen during their captivity as well, um, gives reason why they, a guy like Haman shouldn't have even existed in the first place. So this is one of those places people really have a hard time with it. They have a hard time with it in that God would want an entire group of people to be removed and to be defeated and conquered. And the problem that you have with that is it, it, those people are already lost and God's judging them because they are godless people and he's judging them. The problem is if you leave those same people alive, it's going to have horrible consequence down the road because those people who are already dead spiritually speaking, are going to introduce to you the same abominations that have caused God's wrath on them. And that's the calculation here. So what we read in verse, uh, start at chapter, chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, verse 1, Then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice and the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. First task he has after his anointing. I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel and how he ambushed him on the way and he came, as he came into to, uh, Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And so Saul gathered the people together, numbered them at Telaim, 200,000 uh, foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek to lay uh, in wait in the valley. So we know the rest of it. They, they were given victory in this. And what Saul does is become disobedient and not do exactly as God had said. Because he kept what he said were the best of the things. So read the rest of the chapter. It's really fascinating. And ultimately, when, when uh, Samuel goes to see him, he says, What's that I hear? It's the bleeding of the sheep, knowing that it was from the plunder. So Saul not doing what he wanted to do, what God wanted him to do, he ended up having to be responsible to that. And it's an amazing thing. In fact, you know what? Let's go back to it because I think it's a, it's a very important uh, part just to read because of how impactful it is. And kind of, I, I would say to myself personally, it's, it's a challenging thing that is said here. So uh, verse 19, uh, Samuel says to him, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? 
Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Samuel said, or Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I had gone on the mission and uh, on which the Lord had sent me. I brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, the best of, of the, um, um, the, they took the plunder, uh, of the sheep and the ox and the best of the things that should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord in Gilgal. So Samuel said to him, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to uh, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and sub- uh, stubbornness is as the as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord he also has rejected you from being the king wow and it was going to take a while until he was actually finally removed as being the king but this was it god gave him a specific task he didn't do as he was supposed to do and god says because you will not make god the lord and follow what he says he's done with you pretty heavy stuff But boy, is that a great thing where God would say, if we were to say, look at all of what I've done. And if God said, I didn't ask you to do any of those things, I would rather you obey than all the sacrifices that you want to bring to me. What an amazing thing that was said there. So as we read in verse 11, so the king said to Haman back to Esther. Remember what we just read, verse 10. So the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, remember, King Agag of the Amalekites, and uh, they were the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. So the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written to all that that, uh, Haman commanded. So the king's satraps, the governors, they were over each of the provinces, to the officials of the people, to every province according to its script, to every people in uh, in their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. So it goes to all of the people who would have the ability to see to it that what the king wanted done was actually done to the letter. So, written and it tells you, even in their languages, this just shows you to the uttermost parts of the king's kingdom, this is where it's going to be. So, wherever there would be a Jew, the magistrates would have to know who they are, where they are, and when the time came on that day, they had to affect this order. So, the letters were then sent by couriers in all of the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all of the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. So this would be the other part of it as well. Haman would have said, not only will you be able to eradicate from your midst people who are are subversives, but you'll be able to also take everything that belongs to them. And again, it will increase the treasury, all the rest of it. So there's all these other incentives. Haman just has a personal gripe against Mordecai, and as a result, the Jews. Now he gives a hazardous place to his, his own greed and his own ambition and says, you'll, you'll be rid of anybody that might want to rebel against you, and you can take everything that they have. So this is the order that's put in place. So it tells us, verse 14, a copy of the document was also to be issued as law in every province, being published for all the people that they should be ready for that day. So again, this is an interesting question. What do you do? And uh, again, we'll we'll get a chance to explore this a little bit as we go through, but it's an interesting thing. If you put this out right away, then Jews know, well, how do I get out of here? What do we do to get away? How is it that we find a way to safeguard ourselves from it? Well, in verse 14, or verse 15 rather, it says, so the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, And the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. And so the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. That's an interesting thing because, again, why would they be perplexed? The king can do what he wants to do. Well, remember, if you're Jewish people that are there, you're not Persian. You're there because you've been conquered. Well, 
as the fact that Haman is there as an Amalekite, he's there because they've been conquered as well. How many people in that city were actually Persian as opposed to other ones who lived there because they were part of that, that plundering of the nations? Whether they were just adopted in from what was taken by the, the Babylon, from the Babylonians or from the time after the Babylonians when the Persians started all of their exploits. And those people are now brought in to Shushan. Now, there's a pretty interesting thing. First of all, it might be a couple or both of these things and maybe even more. First part would be, why are they doing this towards the Jews? It just doesn't seem right. It's perplexing. Why would he have a decree against a group of people for reasons that we don't understand? Secondly, well, if he can do it to the Jews, he can do it to us as well. That's got to make them a little bit un, you know, unnerved. But meanwhile, Haman thinks, I finally got what I want. Mordecai and his defiance has not only sealed his fate, but it's going to also take care of the rest of the Jews. And so he's thinking, great, I've won the day. This is exactly what I was wanting. Everything is going according to plan. And so he's able to sit down and he and the king and everything is as it's supposed to be. So what we see is now everything put in place. As we see God has moved his people into place, Mordecai has already done something that's now in the archives, but it's been forgotten. He's basically saved the king's life already, and it's now recorded. Here is Esther, also a Jewish woman, who is now the queen, and she's going to have a voice in this, as we can already tell. But now, at the same time, the devil's really good about this, and we should know this as well. The devil is great about making his plans and trying to do what would be a thwarting of the word of God and, and what he would want done. So what you have now is this tug of war that's already beginning to take place. But you can see the sides being drawn up here. We, because we have hindsight and we're reading about a historical event, can say, yeah, God's name doesn't have to be mentioned in this book for, his, for us to see his hands all over this thing. We also see the work of the devil wanting to eradicate the, these people from the face of the earth, to eliminate the Jews from this, this part of the world, and thereby, the calculation, destroy, though Haman wouldn't have understood this, thus destroy the promise that was made that the Messiah would come through Judah. So you can see why all of the intrigue is taking place here. But, of course, we know the outcome of it, but it's just kind of cool as we go through the chapters of this to see these little bits and these little pieces, these elements, kind of taking shape, and we're seeing what God is doing through this whole process. So um, chapter 4 is when it really starts to get really, really interesting. I'm looking forward to doing the rest of the book and going through the rest of the book. It is a fascinating read, but again, it's just one of those things. This is a, a theological kind of a matter when you stop to think about it. You're not going to learn doctrine from this. This is Esther's not a book of doctrine. It is a book of theology, though. And it, it is that God is preserving his people through the nations and even the places of their captivity because he has greater important things to do down the road. And so he preserves his people through the generations. This is one of many examples that we could cite. But it is fascinating when you get a chance to study through these things. I just, again, it is so, so wonderful and so fascinating to look through these things. So anyhow, we will pick up a chapter four next week. Uh, we'll get through chapter four, probably chapter five as well. And this thing really begins to ramp up in the year from the time of the decree until it finally comes to its fulfillment and everything that God has put in place is kind of revealed in, a, in almost in an instant. So fascinating. Feel free to read ahead if you'd like to. And uh, if anything that we've covered in this uh, gives you reason why you uh, would like to inquire further about it, you can contact us through the website, and that is at oldpaththeology.net. And there's a place there where you can email us. It just says contact us. It pulls up an email window, and you can contact us through the ministry that way. And if you have any questions, you can ask them there about this or anything else. And also, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, clearly you can just use, I, I leave the comment section open so you can make any comments that you'd like to in the actual YouTube channel itself. But we will pick it up at chapter four next week, and uh, I look forward to sharing it with you.